Awesome to say, but you've never had anybody raised from the dead. <laughs> Great that you mentioned that. Why would we examine this category of healings? Well, you know, even if a recovery is psychosomatic, it's better than a non psychos it's better than a non-recovery, right? But this is one where it's pretty hard to say it's psychosomatic. People aren't normally psychosomatically dead. Irreparable brain damage normally begins after just six minutes without oxygen. Now, I could give scores of examples, but some of the examples I'm going to give are from people that I know. I've got like 10 people in, in my or my wife's immediate circle where we know them, where they either witnessed the raising or they were the person raised. In, in terms of uh, Jesus' ministry, it's multiply attested. That is, again, for people who say, well, it's only in one source, the Bible. Well, before the Bible was the Bible, <laughs> these were different, different sources that got put into the Bible. So uh, just from a purely historical standpoint, we do have multiple sources. Uh, where Matthew and Luke overlap, uh, Mark talks about another raising. Luke talks about another raising that's not in either of those. Uh, John talks about a raising. Quadratus, who was a bishop in the early second century, but was still, you know, he was alive already in the first century. He notes that some of the people that Jesus raised from the dead were still alive into his own time. There have been enough accounts of people being raised from the dead, or at least as dead as anybody can tell who's around them. There have been enough accounts of this that we have 10 friends in my wife's or my immediate circle who've either witnessed or experienced uh, people being raised from the dead. When I say experienced, uh, I think it's just one of them here who, who used to be dead, but isn't anymore. Uh, but the, other, the others are uh, all witnesses of it, sometimes have close members of their family. So, oh, tell some of these stories. But it's multiply attested in the early sources about Jesus. When I see early sources, uh, for us as Christians, of course, we can see the Bible as, as a source. But some skeptics will say, oh, it's just one source. But actually, before it was one source, these were a lot of different sources that were put together. So you have <clears throat> um, material overlapping, a source between Matthew and Luke. You have an account of a raising in Mark. You have an account of a raising in Luke. Another, a different one, you have another one in, in John. Also, Quadratus, who was a bishop in the early second century, uh, but of course, didn't he wasn't born in the second century. He was born in the first century. He said that some of the people that Jesus raised from the dead were alive even into his own era. So probably that could include people like uh, Jairus' daughter or the widow of Nan's son, something like that. <clears throat> we also have a number of subsequent raising accounts. For example, we have a couple of them in Acts. Uh, one of them actually is in eyewitness material in Acts. Uh, one of them is, is about someone that Luke had from another source, but one, Luke himself, was there. In the year 99, a Mesopotamian bishop who, who later became a Mesopotamian bishop, he was converted through witnessing somebody being raised. Irenaeus, a leading defender of the four gospels and, and um, orthodox theology in the late second century, around the year 180, claims a church in France where people were being raised from the dead. Um, he, he made it sound like it was fairly common. Augustine, there, there was a time when Augustine said, no, I, I don't believe these miracles are happening anymore. He didn't believe that they never happened anymore, but thought, you know, not, not very much. But he changed his mind after witnessing one and experiencing another one. And so his, uh, his diocese started collecting uh, dossiers where they had uh, affidavits from people who were eyewitnesses of miracles and after, the, after two years, they had 70 of these, which included healings of blindness and somebody being raised from the dead. John Wesley, and again, I'm skipping a lot of church history, but there are other accounts in between. But John Wesley, 
uh, reports, reports something like this in his journal. So uh, understanding what it means that he recorded in, in his journal, this is not just an account that's a few hundred years old and that we can look at it like, well, they, it's just what they said a few hundred years ago. This is an eyewitness account from the time that it happened. So it's just like an eyewitness account today. <clears throat> um, Mr. Myrick fell sick around December 15th. Uh, Wesley also fell sick. Wesley got better. On December 25th, 1742, as far as they could tell, Mr. Myrick had died. They prayed for him. He, he regained consciousness and recovered, and they believed that that, that was a, a raising from the dead. <clears throat> I found scores of I found scores of modern testimonies. Though of course, raisings don't usually happen. And I'm providing uh, just samples here. When I say raisings don't usually happen, even in Mozambique or places like that where a lot of miracles have happened, most people who die stay dead. So if you're dying, uh, don't count on necessarily coming back. Uh, make sure you get everything taken care of right now. But anyway, Dr. Chauncey Crandall, a cardiologist in West Palm Beach, was making his rounds in the hospital one day when somebody named Jeff Markin uh, checked himself into the hospital with chest pains, ended up collapsing in the intake place and was, was uh, taken to ER. They, they struggled for 40 minutes to revive him, following all the American Heart Association protocols he was, he was flatlined for about 40 minutes. When Chauncey Crandall was called in as the cardiologist to, to call the card to say, yeah, he can't be revived. They, they'd done everything they could. There was no way that they could revive him medically. So they pronounced him dead. Crandall went back to his rounds and he was going through some double doors in the hospital. He told me that he felt led by the Holy Spirit to go back and pray for the man to have a second chance to know the Lord. He did go back and pray for the man. One of his colleagues came in with him and he laid hands on the man's head and said, Father, if you want this man to have a second chance to know you, because that's what he felt like the Lord was saying to him, if you want this man to have a second chance to know you, please raise him from the dead tells me the nurse was glaring and they were like, Dr. Crandall, you have lost your mind. <clears throat> so he turned to his colleague and said, shock him with the paddle one more time. And his colleague was like, look, we all agreed nothing more can be done for him, but you know, <laughs> look, you want me to, I'll do it here. Shocked him with the paddle. Suddenly the man had a, a normal heartbeat. Now, even after a few minutes of being flatlined, you don't get a normal heartbeat. Um, this man was not just dead, he was really, really dead in, in, in that he, because of cyanosis, I, the man was white, his, his extremities had already turned black. But suddenly he had a normal heartbeat and the nurse started screaming, Dr. Crandall, Dr. Crandall, what have you done? Like, this is Frankenstein's monster. Remember, six minutes with no oxygen, you have irreparable brain damage. But Jeff Markin did have his second chance to know the Lord. And here's a picture of Dr. Crandall participating in Jeff's baptism. And um, Dr. Crandall and I have been in, in touch some uh, since that time as well. And apparently uh, he and Jeff go around and tell their stories sometimes in, in churches. Now, there's a spiritual backstory of this too. I'm, I'm not always giving you the spiritual backstory, but in this case, Dr. Crandall, this wasn't the first time he prayed for somebody to be raised from the dead. His own son, Chad, had died of leukemia, and they had prayed and prayed, but Chad died. Chauncey Crandall prayed for his son to be raised. He wasn't. And at that point, Dr. Crandall said he had to make, make a choice. I'm either going to just be so devastated I'm not going to be able to trust God for a while or I'm going to trust God no matter what because God is worthy of trust and he decided in the latter 
And about a year later, when the Lord moved him to pray for this other man, he was ready spiritually. Now, he didn't feel very spiritual on the day. He was just obeying the prompting. He was like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just going to, I look like an idiot, but I'm going to pray this. But it happened. But he had been faithful in the hard times. Dr. Sean George is a consultant physician in Kalgoorlie, Australia. Well, in 2008, at the age of 39, he started having a heart attack. And he, uh, he checked himself into a, a clinic. Uh, he, he was actually on the road at the time. He checked himself into a clinic run by a friend of his. But um, the electrocardiogram showed that he was having a heart attack. Now, one thing you don't want to do if you're having a heart attack is read your electrocardiogram uh, and find out that you're having a heart attack because then you're really going to have a heart attack. So 11 minutes later, he went into full cardiac arrest and they labored for 55 minutes with 4,000 chest compressions and 13 shocks to try to resuscitate him. And finally, they, they had to give up. They, they couldn't do anymore. Well, they were waiting for his wife to get there. His wife, uh, Sherry Jacob, was also a physician, is also a physician. And, um, and she and some of his other friends from the hospital where he worked were, were coming together. They got there. Uh, it took him an hour and 25 minutes because of how far away the clinic was to get there. And when they got there, you know, he had been, he'd been dead for like an hour and a half at this point. They said, you just want to say your goodbyes and we're going to uh, detach the, the stuff. And instead of saying your goodbye, and, and this is not guaranteed, this is not something that always happens, but instead of saying your goodbye, she fell down beside his body and said, God, Sean is so young. We've been married just a little time. What about our kids? Please give me back, Sean. And suddenly, his heart started again. Now, keep in mind, his organs have been shutting down. Six minutes with no oxygen, your brain is dead. But he came to life. And the, the, you know, his colleagues were like, well, let's get to it. And they, and they jumped in. And, but one of his colleagues confided later, that was the worst thing that could possibly happen. Because if he comes back to life, well, we can keep him on a ventilator or something. But sooner or later, Sherry's going to have to make the choice to take him off. Mm -hmm. But three days later, he awoke with no brain damage. This time he wasn't reading his uh, electrocardiogram reading, but he was reading his charts. Uh, and the non-Christian doctors, I mean, some of his colleagues were Hindus and Muslims. They both agree, this is a miracle that God did. This doesn't normally happen. And because he's a doctor, he knew how to keep medical documentation. So he still has the defibrillator logs, which are public on his website. Now, this next account is from Indonesia. Um, from my neighbor Yusuf. Um, I have this picture here to remind me to tell you for the next picture, not to look if you pass out of the sight of blood. This is not Yusuf's own story, it's his friend's story. He helped me interview his friend. But the next picture, um, you can see his friend was pretty well dead. I mean, his neck was clearly cut, and this is after the body had been moved, so it's not in the bloodiest scene. Uh, as they're taking him to the hospital, um, you can see they're not treating him like a live body. Um, but meanwhile, he had an experience of heaven, and he came back into his body, and as the doctors in the hospital were getting ready to send him to the morgue, he let them know he was still alive. And they were shocked, but of course, they, they did their good doctor stuff. He still needed medical help to sew back his neck, but I mean, he's alive, and now when he gives his testimony, it's like, you know, Jacob's still out his limp. <laughs> he, you know, he has, he has something to show for it. But anyway, um, giving some African examples from some people I know, which I think reduces the po possibility of fraud. These are people who are reliable people in terms of um, their, their testimony. And a lot of them are people with something to lose by telling the testimony. Professor Ayo Adewuya 
at a scholars meeting. And of course, you know, as I've said before, scholars don't all, they're not all like, yes, miracles happen. <laughs> uh, that's, that's not the way we're trained. You know, we're trained to like rule out every other possible explanation before we possibly consider a miracle. But anyway, at a scholars meeting, I was presenting some of this evidence. And I was saying, you don't have to believe in miracles, but at least they don't say eyewitnesses can't claim stuff like this because we've got lots of eyewitnesses who do claim stuff like this. So at the end of, of my presentation, you know, somebody was asking a question about this. And they were, they were very respectful. I, I, you know, they, I, I'm sure they didn't all agree, but they were very respectful. Like, I mean, the way academicians should be when we disagree with each other or when we agree, you know, be respectful. Um, Io uh, stood up at the end and he said, you know, my son, was born dead January 1st, 1981. And uh, we, we prayed for half an hour and he came back to life. And he has no brain damage. In fact, uh, uh, his son now has master of science degree from University of London. And if I'm not mixing up his sons, uh, I think he also has an MBA as well. So, uh, here are some examples from Congo Brazzaville. This is my, my wife's country. All these examples are from the, the mainstream uh, Protestant church, the uh, Eglise Evangelique du Congo. It's the uh, leading uh, evangelical and Protestant church in, in Congo Brazzaville. Um, so, I mean, if we, if we had surveyed Pentecostals and so on, we might've gotten more, but, uh, these were people that my wife knows, people to whom she introduced me, uh, and I got to know as well. So uh, actually, the president of the denomination at the time, Pastor Swami, had an account of his own son being raised. But we also got some accounts from Jean Mabiala. She, she actually gave us three eyewitness accounts, people that she had prayed for, that as far as anybody could tell, they were dead. She prayed, they came back to life. I'm going to give just uh, one of these accounts. Uh, by the way, there were there were multiple witnesses for a number of these. So in one of the cases, actually, the raising was also witnessed by my brother-in-law, Dr. Emmanuel Musunga, uh, who's a professor of chemistry at the University of Brazzaville. But um, one of them was a baby that was born dead. And so during the war, where she and my wife, uh, who was not yet my wife at the time, were refugees, uh, during the war, there was a baby that was born and the umbilical cord was tied around the baby's neck. The baby was already gray. Apparently the baby had died during the night in the mother's womb. The father sadly went out and started building a coffin, but there were um, a, a couple women there with Mama Jean and she said, let's pray. And they, they began to pray. And by the time the father came back in, the baby was alive and they named her Milgras, Thousandfold Grace. And she's mm -hmm. now in school, she's doing fine. Uh, she's a deacon in the Evangelical Church of Congo. Albert Bisweswe, or Albert Bisweswe uh, was also, uh, is also a deacon in the Evangelical Church of Congo. Um, at the time when he was a school inspector in the north of Congo in the, in the community called Etumbi, one day he, he, he found a, a crowd gathered near his home. And what had happened was they brought him a corpse. A, a girl had died and about uh, for the next eight hours, they were trying different means to revive her through traditional healings. Uh, some shamans killed uh, some animals, smeared the blood in her mouth, nose, eyes, and ears. If she wasn't genuinely dead at the beginning of all this, she was pretty surely dead by the end of it. Um, so they brought this child. They said, okay, we tried everything else. Uh, can the Christian do anything for us? And he said, why did you go to all these other places first? You should have come here first. You should have come to the true and the living God. You need to turn from these, these false gods. They, 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 won't, they won't help you. But he took the child aside to the place where he normally prayed and prayed. And half an hour 
later gave her back to the family alive. Well, as you might imagine, that made quite an impression in Itumbi. And so the next time a child died, they came looking for Albert Bisweswe, but he wasn't there. He was off somewhere inspecting schools in another locality. So they got his wife, Julienne, to pray. She came and prayed, and she sang a song about Lazarus, and then she prayed, and this child came back to life. And afterwards, she was like, oh, I can't believe this just happened. You know, but mm -hmm. in, in the moment, God gave her the courage to do what she needed, needed to do. So this wasn't just a one-off. This happened twice. So I said, well, you know, maybe they just pray for everybody is dead. And once in a while, they, they strike it. They strike it good. You know, maybe, maybe it's a misdiagnosed death, right? So I asked, how many times have you prayed for people who are dead? Just those two times. It was just something special God was doing in Etumbi.